So, so Lynn and I thought I'd just start by um, by starting with the, the question that's pretty much on everybody's lips right now. What is your theme song? <laughs> <laughs> and why? <laughs> he, he's, he's used to these. <laughs> we did this at Draper University and Good, this is a stumper. I know. Like, I'm trying to think of, like, when and last did I listen to music? <laughs> theme song. How about the, something that matters to, like, I mean, it could be like We Are the World, right? Or that's be, a good one. That's, 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 I don't, it didn't come to me like that. I'll take it. Sure. Okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, okay, so uh, tell us a little I, bit. I should say Kung Fu Fighting. Oh, nice. that, that feels more like the, the theme song. It's Kung Fu Fighting. <laughs> That, 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 yeah, that, that, that feels like that every day. <laughs> Kung Fu fighting, just go to fight, <laughs> keep on fighting. Um, okay, tell us how underwater hockey is uh, played. Eventually, we'll find out about Solar City, but yeah, I, I just want to get to the important yeah, exactly, things. Right? Yeah, we so don't always the, have time for that. Um, so, mask, fins, uh, one hand and stick, um, a, a puck's made of lead at the bottom of the pool. You play six players aside in the water. You have uh, four subs, so ten players a team. 15-minute uh, halves. You go down, hold your breath, play as long as you can. Before you run out of air, you give the puck to your buddy. You go up, get some air, and you just alternate. Now, it's, it's actually not a, uh, a big uh, spectator sport, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's tremendous fun. In fact, I'm trying to get uh, Stanford to, to create a team. So any plug you can do to get there. Are there any like rules? Can you dunk? A, can you keep a guy down? Yeah, yeah. No drowning is allowed. Um, the uh, it, it's kind of like possible where there's actually no real filing, but you do you can check somebody. You can you can there can be a little filing, but it's actually a very very friendly sport. Um, uh, it's it's often played co-ed. Actually, mainly played co-ed only at the international competitions. Is it played? Uh, um, men and women, but uh, mainly at the local pickups. It's co-ed, so it's, it's real friendly. It's a, if, you, if you like swimming, this is far better than swimming. <laughs> swimming, you get tired of that black line for a long time. Um, and then uh, if you like water polo, those are the type of players that, that often come and, and play the sport. You need a, a bottom that's uniform. Yes, yeah, so, so that's the one, one criteria. You need, you need a flat bottom. Um, or I guess you could play from side to side. You, you always play over the, the width of a, of a oh, pool. The width. It's, oh, it's okay. a width of an Olympic-sized pool. So it's 20 meter, 25 meters by, by 15 meters is, is typically the, the length and width. That's great. And feet, I forget what that I is. That should be a varsity sport here. Okay, so, um, okay, so you are a very close cousin to Elon <laughs> Musk, and your brother also grew up in the family, apparently. And... Uh, and so your mothers were twins, right? Yeah. So what was it in this family? I mean, this is amazing what you guys have accomplished. And is it like, did they say, Lyndon, you have to save the world. You have to, you know, we, the world's getting too hot. We need solar energy. Or did, did she just sort of kind of let you run free and, and I, I hopefully... Think the, the environmental thing came up um, way later. Like we, we were brought up in, in South Africa. It's like the country still doesn't do recycling. Like it's just to put it in perspective. So there's no... And maybe they're just starting now, but um, it, it's not... Uh, environmental is not a big focus, or at least it wasn't when I, when I was growing up. Um, that, that happened as, as we got older. And, um, and, and I'm not sure if it just uh, happened that, that we wanted to solve the problem. But when you, when you, before uh, Solar City, um, we had a software business, and nothing wrong with software. Great, great software companies out there. But when you're in the grind, back to the comfort of fighting, like every morning you're waking up and you just get into the grind and you just work, work, work. At the end of the day, if the only outcome is is, is financial, that 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 gets old, and uh, you want something that can get you more motivated. Because otherwise, you you don't work as hard, you don't push yourself as hard. And so uh, uh, finding a job where you can actually uh, have a financial reward but also have an environmental reward or a different reward, that is something that helps humanity, that's exciting because you can get up, feel passionate about it, and it's a double win. And so that, that's, that's kind of what led it to it. 
So, um, yeah, you, okay, so before Solar City, you uh, ran Everdream. That's right. And Everdream did other things, you know, it was a different business. How has, how has that affected Solar City? Did you learn something from Everdream that made you realize that you, sh you should be doing something a little different at Solar City? It, yes, so, so one thing I, I liked about Everdream, it, it's, it's, okay, it, it was a okay outcome. Um, it, it wasn't a, a, a wild success. We ended up selling to Dell Computers for uh, 120 million. Um, the, uh, in that period, we went through the dot bomb. Um, and DFJ supported us all the way through, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> they, they, they gave me my first uh, $2 million check when I was 22 years old. And I was like, wow, <laughs> real money. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that started uh, uh, Everdream. Um, but in that period, the, the financial crisis, or at least uh, specifically the software financial crisis in the Bay Area occurred, and it was the, the technology crash. Um, the experience somebody learns out of, out of facing real, real problems uh, makes you uh, a better athlete. Like, like you just, you, you have to work harder, you have to hone your skills better. And so I'd say that that experience uh, helped a lot at, in, in Solar City. It just, uh, we had to solve problems that we probably wouldn't have, have to solve if the company didn't have the financial, or at least the, the technology crash. Um, and then we grew out of that technology crash and then ended up selling it to, to Dow. So, so it was an uh, okay outcome, um, but uh, uh, that, I'd say, was invaluable. So, okay, now, Solar City, is, uh, you, um, you uh, install all the panels everywhere, and then, uh, and then it generates energy, and that energy goes up onto the grid. And after a while... Uh, Somehow you end up owning the the whole grid. I mean, you end up owning at least all all of the energy that comes off those panels. How does the financial model work? Yeah, it's, so it's it's when we started the business, uh, the entire market, specifically the the residential market, um, the only way you could buy a solar system is if, is if you you bought it. So you have to use uh, uh, home. Your, your, your own capital to pay for a commodity, which, you, which is an operating cost. And so, so the only reason for actually doing this is if you really are like a strong environmentalist um, or you, you, you have disposable cash and you look at the long-term returns, then it's a, a fair, fair, fair investment. So since the, in the beginning, solar was, uh, was a product for, for, for the rich. Like you had to have lots of money to come out with it and uh, at least to, disposable cash to, to, to pay for it. So we looked at it and said, okay, we have to create a business model where it makes it really easy for people to adopt solar. And the way how people are buying energy today, they don't actually go pay for the power plant. They just pay for, you know, uh, as you use it. And so we created that model and um, uh, allowed us to install the solar system for free. So the customer doesn't pay for the equipment, doesn't pay for the installation, but only pays for the energy. And so then as the energy produces, they pay for that. And then we charge less for that energy than they currently pay from the utility. So given the choice of paying more for dirty energy from the utility or less for clean energy from us, um, that's what helped us. That's enabled us to grow the, the level that we've grown right now. We've made it an easy decision for a customer to get uh, clean energy. And part of, that, um, part of that differential has come from some government subsidies that, um, that have declined a little bit. Uh, uh, significantly. Wh what's the... What you're thinking on that, where, where do those come out over time? What, what happens? Why did they give you the subsidies in the first place? And then why are they decreasing them? And what do you think is going to happen in the future? Yeah, it's just all <laughs> energy in the country is, is highly, highly subsidized, like highly subsidized. Um, and the subsidies go so deep, you can't even identify the subsidies. Like if you asked them, please come up with a list of all the subsidies, they will miss them. I kid you not. They'll be like, wait, here's an example. I just have to mm -hmm. get that, that backdrop. It's, it's a passionate point for me. Um, in California, you, uh, you have to get a building permit to install a solar system. That permitting process delays the installation. So imagine you have a highway, you've got cars coming in, and all the cars have to stop for a week. A week. That's going to cause a serious backup. 
not only is it the cost of the uh, installation, but it's the cost of throughput of the business. Um, there's few things we don't need a, uh, a permit in, in, the, in the state. If you're going to do a, a small fence around your, your house, you don't need a permit. If you're going to do a small retaining wall, you don't need a permit. If you're going to do a small tool shed, you don't need a, a permit. And if you're going to do an oil derrick, you don't need oil a permit. Oil derrick? <laughs> just saying. If you want an oil derrick, um, you don't need it. So, so it's just like, that's not an incentive. That doesn't get captured anywhere as an incentive. It's just the way you deploy oil derricks. And here's the crazy thing. If you want to structure around the oil derrick, you don't need a permit for that either. All the fraternity guys are thinking, how do we build a derrick, an oil <laughs> derrick, <laughs> exactly. right here? No, it's like, and then, normally when I show this, I show houses in Malibu, nice house, beautiful house, oil derrick, nice house. It's like, oh, how did that just pop up? The, the building department doesn't even know they're there. You don't have to ask for a permit. That's how crazy it is. In Texas, it's faster to get a permit for a fracking facility than it is for a solar system for a house. Oh yeah, so that was just my little rampage on, on, on uh, energy, uh, uh, energy incentives. So uh, at the start, uh, solar did get incentives, um, and most of the states offered uh, uh, rebates. So the two primary incentives, it's a state incentive and a federal uh, incentive. The state incentives um, uh, help in, uh, initiated the market. It was really, really important. In California, there was the, the Million Home Solar Initiative, uh, that that uh, uh, worked really, really well. It's not quite a million homes, but it, it got the start of it. Um, and it was a billion dollar program. Um, the plan was that program to last for 10 years. It only lasts for like six and a half, seven years. But the industry did its job. So the industry reduced its cost as the, inst uh, the state incentives reduced. And now for the last three years, there's been no state incentives in California. Most of the states for the last three years haven't had any state incentives. So the only remaining state in, uh, incentive right now is the federal tax credit. And the federal tax credit has a 30% tax credit for solar systems. And that's going to be expiring in 2016 for residential owners. And for commercial, it's going to go from 30% down to 10%. I hope that doesn't happen. It would be bad policy if it does happen. But we are preparing for that. It, uh, that it oh, you happen. said it will be happening. But it's going to happen. It's going to expire. You're, you're, uh, oh, it'll expire. But... Uh, is there a possibility, the choice is, do they renew or do yeah, they it's, pull it's, it away? It's, right? So it's, the, it's going to expire unless um, DC uh, makes a change. Um, oh. the, there's this fair amount of gridlock right now in DC, um, but, I, but I think it, it will get it renewed. A get of a higher probability than not that it doesn't get renewed. I mean, if, we, if we look at the, the problem we need to solve, uh, you know, climate change is a, is a real big problem. Like, I don't know how many storms it will take for us to realize this. I don't know how many fires it will take before we realize this. Like, how, how catastrophic does it have to be before we go, oh, shit, we have no choice but to react? Um, I think the signal will be loud enough right now. But it looks like we have to turn the signal up even further. So hopefully we don't have to. But um, bad policy would be not to continue with that, uh, as we have the solution to our, you know, the world's biggest problem. And if, if, we, if we stop it, I think 20 years from now, you go, OK, we had the solution, and we decided not to fix it because of a tax delta between 30% and 10%. Um, that would be crazy. Um, now, the true best solution to do is not to extend the federal tax credit for solar. Don't have it. But penalize those who are killing us, who are polluting the, the, the atmosphere. Like, pay for the pollution. It's very basic. If the pollution was a liquid, you'd have to pay for it. Because it's an air, you don't have to pay for it. Um, so pay for the pollution. And, and so then that would be essentially a tax on, on carbon. Um, but based on the uh, political influence, uh, I think that's a low probability of that, that happening. So if that can't happen, then continue uh, incentivizing those who are providing energy that is, is, is not uh, uh, bad for us. So, um, so your your work is here, two questions here. Your work is um, saving the planet. It's an ambitious goal. Mm -hmm. um, your work is saving the planet, and Elon is sort of helping with the saving of the planet, but he's also trying to get us off the planet. 
which is more important? <laughs> it's, it's the, and, um... and 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 uh, is there? Do the curves somehow eventually flatten out where you get the global warming and then there's Solar City and it starts to flatten out, or are you just sort of delaying the inevitable where we all just fry? It, it, for, for, for those who play a sport, do you ever give up? If you, like professional sport, doesn't matter what the score is, you never give up. Like you just play all the way through because things can change and you can go through. Right now the scoreboard looks pretty bad, um, but I think we can win. Um, but back to Tesla, uh, Solar City, and, and Occupy Mars. Um, the uh, uh, so Solar City or the solar industry is addre addressing our, our electrical issues. So electricity is the cause for the largest air pollution in, in the country, um, right at parity with transportation. So electric vehicles then address that. So you have to address both our energy consumption and our transportation if you really want to have an impact on, on climate change and to mm. be taken it from both angles. And then the eject path is, uh, is Mars. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's more, for some, just, just, that's more for like a catastrophic uh, event. Now, um, now, do you, I mean, let's say the whole planet was covered with solar city panels. Um, does that slow global warming? in some way, or is it just a cleaner way? Does it make it so that there's less particulate? What, what's the science here? Yeah, it's, so absolutely, it will have an impact. Now, um, it'll take a long time to, to undo, but you'll stop it from getting worse. Um, uh, but that, this is a 20, 30 year initiative. Like this is this big. Uh, and if it's just the U.S., it still doesn't solve the problem. We have to get the U.S., we have to get China, we have to get all, all, all the big countries. Um, then we have to start focusing on the developing countries because they, they, they're burning a, a cheap cost of energy, which is coal. Um, so, so we have to address it all over the place. Um, but assuming that scenario, if we had a magic wand and we could do it right now, it would solve the problem. Absolutely. So here's another question. Can, are, have you thought, like, is your R&D department working on something kind of science fiction-y, like um, putting solar panels outside the atmosphere and, in effect, blocking the sun's ray at noon or something like that, where somehow you're, you're collecting the energy outside the atmosphere and then beaming it down. So if you think of all en uh, most energy, uh, actually most, all the energy that we burn right now uh, comes, comes from the sun. You, you, uh, the light hits a plant. Just talk about inefficiency, just, just like to walk you through the, the equation of, of uh, most of our fossil fuel. Um, light hits the plant, the tree gets bigger, then eventually the tree dries, then it uh, goes into the ground for a million years, <coughs> then we dig it out, then we <coughs> haul it out to a, a factory uh, or a, a, a plant, we burn it, that burn uh, then heats up water, creates steam, and makes a moves the turbine to create electricity, then we haul that electricity all the way back to your house, and, and then you can use it. That's step one, alternative. Skip that process, put little glass panels on your roof, capture the light, create energy. I think that is more efficient than that other process. Um, so, so we'll get there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the cost curve has come down significantly. So, so now we, we are more competitive than uh, kerosene, more competitive than diesel. This is what, no subsidy at all. Um, uh, in the US, we're more competitive than uh, most uh, uh, energy sources in, in most states. Uh, we're, we're in 18 states today, um, but that is tied to the, it is dependent on the 30% tax credit. Okay, let's switch to your. Um Actually, one other comment on uh, yeah. on, uh, on the R and D department. Uh, yes, no, no, no space oh. team. We do have an R and D department. We we've just announced the most efficient module, solar module in the world. I'm not right. sure if you guys saw that. That was a big deal. Um, good uh, job. Yeah, that was, yeah, right. that's nice. Taking a record from a competitor it feels good. Um, <laughs> but the uh, that, that just to satisfaction, that record will move around. So it's, 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 it's trophies. So you get to keep it for a little while. Competitor takes it. You get it back. So that it makes us all better. So it's actually it's a good thing. Um, but in terms of, like, as we look at expanding it internationally, we go to many countries, and uh, back to the incentives, 
Um, like I, I'm from South Africa, and the uh, finance prime minister came to us saying, "Hey, you should you should expand to South Africa." Uh, but okay, um, sounds great. Uh, good sun, uh, amazing country. Um, what's your cost of energy? Oh, no, the cost of energy is around 15 cents a kilowatt hour. I'm like, okay, that's, that's not bad. It's, like, it's, it's mm -hmm. pretty good. It's pretty efficient. Uh, uh, why, why is it so, so low? Oh, no, we, we highly subsidize. We, we pay, the government pays about half the cost of energy. Okay, so you're saying without the government subsidy, um, your coal generation and your, your cost of energy would be roughly 30 cents. Yeah, yeah, it'd be roughly around 30 cents. Okay, so we, we need to come in there and, and, and compete and, and, so, and help you with this. Yeah, absolutely, we need you. We have a big energy crisis. We have blackouts all over the place. No, you go, great. So, so you're paying for half of coal. Um, what, what's your plan for solar? Oh, no, we can't give you anything. No, we have to solve this problem. You're subsidizing. It should give you 15 cents. <laughs> exactly. You could end up getting paid. But it is amazing how many developing countries are out there where, they, where a source of stimulants is to pay for the electricity, which is bad. Rather just give it as a, as a credit, because it's, it artificially holds bad energy cost low. And um, so that's what, that's what we're up against. And, and that's worldwide. Yeah. So you got to change people's thinking. You, you have to work on it. A lot of things. Every entrepreneur has to face that. And the entrenched <coughs> people who are entrenched are going to clearly fight that. And so you you're going to be, it's, it'll be a fun long-term battle fighting. for you. Hey, just fu keep <laughs> kung fu fighting. So um, here are, you've got, you, you said 13,000 employees, is that right? It's, it's 14. 14,000, it's, it's okay. Like we add a little few every, yeah. every month. A lot of overhead. Yeah, it's, um, the, it's, it's revenue generating. Yeah, revenue, good. Uh, we're trying to keep uh, overhead flat. We've got, we've got a cap and trade program. Cap and trade's good. If you want to add extra one in uh, overhead, go to trade with somebody. So are they um, W-2 or, or 1099s or both? All our employees are W-2s. Oh, yeah. okay. So, so they're full-time employees. Full-time employees, pay all the benefits, benefits, stock options, all that everything. Stuff. So it's like uh, number one asset in the company is our employees. We really make sure that they have uh, good wages. It's, it's the uh, it's a challenge, but we've successfully managed to pay people more at the same time reducing cost. So that, that was, uh, I was, we're happy about that incentive plan that we came up with that, that enabled uh, that to happen. So um, how do you, I, I kind of think, you know, people probably ask, how do you manage that many employees? But maybe it's how do you communicate with all those employees? How do you Problem. get that, you know, whenever you come up with something new and you need to pass that on to the 14,000 people, what do you do to make sure that it, Penetrates and they grok it and they're ready to. Yeah, go. It's, it's not easy. Like that, it's, a, it's a big problem. So we've tried different things. Um, the one that's just seeming to work right now is every week we, we have what we call Solar City TV. Um, and then we'll get different people to speak on the TV. It's an hour show. Um, uh, we broadcast it into the entire company. And uh, uh, it's, it's a good participant that shows up. So we can track the amount of people logging on, uh, how many people watch it afterwards. And that's a good way to, to get information out. And then uh, um, uh, uh, email, which is never that great, but, but we, we do, do a fair amount of email. So email is intense um, in the company, a little too much. But that is a form of communication. And then just making sure that you, you communicate to your leadership as much as possible so that they can carry, carry it. Um, is there a feedback loop back to you? Is there some way that they, they see something out there in the marketplace they can turn around and say, hey, you ought to pay attention to this? Yes, yeah, so it, <clears throat> it, it, has, it gets harder as the company gets bigger, but it, the culture that we embrace is a total open communication. Anyone, anyone who sends me an email, I always respond, although there's a lot. I, I'll get back to them. Um, best to send me emails on Fridays because that then you have the best and you response time. You've got the yeah. weekend. If you send me an email on Monday, oh, that could be a long response time. You may have to wait till the next Saturday before I get to that one. Uh, weekends are my catch-up time on, on, on email. But the, so, so I always respond on that. Um, the, you know, it's, it's a cube environment, which, which is common here in the, in, in the Bay Area. Um, uh, and, and you make sure you get out in the field all the time. So... Um, <coughs> You do it all on weekends. How, your wife doesn't like that too much, probably. 
so here's the trick. Um, <coughs> so I have some of the same problems, the, so I just want to. The way I, I, I think I managed to, to solve this is I, I managed to uh, find my wife when I was really young. Uh, I, we met when we were 14. I tried to date her for two years. She said no, but at 16, she said she said yes. Um, so we we've been together uh, ever since. Um, got married at 24. That's great. Had our first kid at, at 30. So, so she's, she's my lifetime partner and the best person in the world. But the secret of that is she doesn't know anything better. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like she has no idea. You mean this is how it works? And so then when I find friends, I make sure the friends are with uh, husbands like me, <laughs> meaning that they're never there. They're always working. Um, so, so you keep this little box. She's starting to figure out it's not true, and that um, 80 hour work weeks is, is, not, is not normal, and um, uh, that the, the dad actually, or the husband actually has to be there sometimes. Um, so so the, the pressure's getting, getting, getting there. Uh, uh, we've negotiated a lot of mm -hmm. things. Uh, I'm, I'm a very analytical guy, I like, I like data, I like to measure things. So, so when there's a debate about, mm -hmm. hey, you're not at the family enough, they go, but it feels like I'm being with the family enough. Uh, no, you haven't. And so this, this emotional thing where you just have to guess what the right answer is, I can't handle. So, so we actually came down to a quota. 16 hours a week is my quota that I have to uh, achieve um, to, to be with the with family. I know it sounds rude or Can crude. you be uh, asleep during some? No, no, it has to be quality of time. And so, so <laughs> if it, it's, it's a... Um, so 16 hours, you know, it, it's doable. So if you, if you do one hour a day, then weekends are okay. Uh, if you don't do anything during, in, in, the, in the week, then you've got eight hour days on weekends with the kids, and that's a long day. <laughs> <laughs> I love my kids to bits, by the way. No, some of it's, um, but yeah, so, so that's, uh, she's, she's fantastic, but she's, she's managing it. Okay, so back to the business. Um, when, I, when entrepreneurs come to me and they say, hey, you know, what should I have to get funding from you? How do I do that? Um, I'm always saying, well, one of the things I'm always looking for is how do you get your customers to become your sales force? <laughs> so what are you doing to getting your customers to become your sales force? How do you get them out there doing your work for you? Yeah, actually that's, that's really good. Um, uh, one third of our business comes from our customers. Uh, and so that's uh, and so we, we've essentially created this ambassador program. So there are referrals from neighbors or something. N neighbors, yeah. yes. So it's a, it's, a, it's a dual referral. If you uh, if you're a customer and you refer your neighbor, your neighbor gets a discount, and, and you get an incentive. Um, so it, it's if you don't do it that way, you're kind of selling out your neighbor because you get an incentive. But now the difference is you're hooking up your neighbor. Very big difference. And so this is a small, ch small change. So hook up your neighbor, um, get them a discount. And uh, so, so that, that has worked well. Um, and then they can become ambassadors too and hook up their neighbors too. And um, our ambassador program, and then sometimes homes don't qualify. So you run across a house at the orientation of the house, or there's too much shading, or the roof is too old, or something may be wrong with the house. Um, but the person's passionate about uh, uh, solar and passionate about trying to help climate change, uh, they may just become an ambassador. And we have a lot of ambassadors on even customers that start referring customers to us. So um, if um, ha you guys are the leaders in this market, and, uh, but there are still some competitors that are com coming along, what is your competitive advantage and how is that going to play out in the future? And is it, is it easy to jump into your business or, or not? And, and, and then maybe what might come and hit you from some other angle where you, you get blindsided like Napster did to the music industry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, in terms of what differentiates us uh, is, is our vertical integration strategy. So, from the beginning, we've decided to vertically integrate. Now, the downside of that is you have to manage 14,000 people. That's a lot of people. Um, uh, now, now, the upside of that is you can optimize costs, you can optimize customer experience, you can optimize for product. So early on, we made the decision to vertically integrate. And so when we looked at our competitors, they were not. In order to get solar, somebody else would sell you the system 
Then another, uh, and, and they would probably do the installation too, but some other one asked would do the financing. In some cases, you'd, you'd, you'd have extreme. You'd have somebody sell you the system, another person you'd sell, uh, do the financing, and then another person would do the installation. Um, in fact, it's still quite a bit of the market. You have three different companies you're working with just to get a solar system in your house. And so out of the gate, our competition was ahead of us because they could leverage other people's infrastructure um, and, and have them do the sale and installation. Um, but when you are in a small market like us, that infrastructure gets depleted. Like they can't grow more than those 20 or 30 partners. And um, the only way they can grow is either they provide the working capital needed for those companies to grow, or grow at a rate that they can just grow with their own profit that they make. So it's, it's just, you just won't be able to grow faster. And so out of the gate, that model was better, or at least it seemed to be better. And then we overtook it uh, at, a, at a healthy pace. And the reason being is because we invest in the infrastructure, we can invest in that warehouse and get it up to the right capacity because it's, it's our warehouse. But unless you improve the efficiency, you, you will not, you, you'll get a point where you, you just can't drive the cost down because the glass is going to cost the glass. Like the glass is going to have its uh, cost. The aluminum around the frame is going to have its, the cost. The, uh, the, the plastic or the back sheet at the back is, is going to have that cost. So, so you're not going to be able to get that cost down because those are pure, very much pure commodities. Um, but if you have generation two, so if you have higher efficiency, this is to simply say if, if your modules double the efficiency, then you can provide double the amount of power or energy on the same uh, fixed cost of that, of that solar frame. Um, and so that's why we, we, we invested into it. Um, we're convinced we can create high efficiency solar modules at the same price as, as standard efficiency modules. And, um, and then if you're able to do that, you can either install more uh, energy on a roof um, uh, or install less panels on the roof. And so you actually have, not only do you have uh, the extra revenue from that power, but you also have efficiency in your crew and you reduce your cost. So um, if you play that out, though, uh, won't other suppliers go, oh, I see how you do that. I'm going to do that, too. And then they start driving the prices down again, and you, you've got this big plan and all these assets you've wasted on this thing, and somebody else is doing a better job. That's right. You're just going to do the better job. You, you have to just keep pushing. Okay, so push you're, are you thinking you might just keep driving new technologies into Keep, keep on driving. But it's, it's, <clears throat> if the others follow, remember, the, the, at our growth, and if you fast forward three years now, four years from now, our capacity, the manufacturing capacity is only going to be one gig. Um, that only may be half, a third, or a quarter, depending on what, what year you look at, of our volume. So we want the other ones to get a product as good as ours. Like we want it to come down. We want to push the industry to say that standard efficiency is not okay. Like no one is working on generation two, um, and the only ones who are working on that are startup companies who just don't have the capital and don't have the bankability of the assets. So it's like the circular event that even if they do have amazing technology, to get it to market is near to impossible because nobody will buy the module because there's no warranty behind it. At least there is, but it's, it's nothing. And so... You, you have to get the big manufacturers to, to, to chase this technology. And um, my hope is that that pushes the, the other manufacturers to do it too. Um, and now you're manufacturing these in the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, ha did you run into any problems or opportunities or whatever by setting up a plant in the United States? And what state did you put it in and why? Yes, yeah, so, so we have it in uh, New York. Uh, it's in <coughs> Buffalo. So it's a million square foot building. Actually, I have a live camera feed of it. It's still being built. It's, it's really cool. Um, the, uh, when we acquired the solar company that... Um, it's in uh, Buffalo. Does it benefit the manufacturing to make it cold? Uh, <laughs> to have cold weather outside? <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. no, not really. But yeah, the, uh, uh, the whole thing and the fact that it is in Buffalo, um, actually the primary, one of the primary reasons is uh, you can use hydro. Um, uh, creating solar modules is energy intensive. Um, so if you can actually use clean energy to create clean energy, that's better than using dirty energy to create clean energy. 
So, so are you using Niagara Falls to yeah, do this? It's, it's, it will oh be my your, God! Yeah, so and so that how what do you pay per kilowatt hour from we Niagara st we're Falls? We're still negotiating, but just standard uh, 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 rates are around uh, five cents a kilowatt hour. Wow! And, that's, and so actually, one of the that's reasons that's cheap, by the way. It's, uh, one of the reasons why we we uh, uh, we have a factory in China. Um, uh, one of the reasons why we didn't do the big factory in China is that the cost of energy in China is actually fairly high. It's like fifteen cents a kilowatt hour. And so when you look at your uh, shipping cost, but not just your shipping cost, when you ship equipment, you have your carrying cost of, um, of your inventory on, on the ocean. So you've got to include that into your working capital cost, combined with the energy cost. Um, uh, logistically, we think that Buffalo can be very competitive. Yeah, that's great. Buffalo needs the jobs, too. That's, that's the reason. And, I'm and sure they, put, they, they give you any subsidy to go to they, Buffalo. They give us a good incentive. Yeah, that's great. A fair, a fair incentive. Buffalo, Senna, it's fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess we've gone into most of that. Um, are there any other things that you're um, thinking about as you pursue, as you grow this business, as you, what is it going to look like 15 years from now. I always have this 15-year rule for my entrepreneurs. When they come to me, I, I say, is this company really going to be there in 15 years when we have self-driving trucks that take all your the robot factories that take everything to, through self-driving trucks that you know, construct your house by itself? And Little printer. Yeah, with a 3D printer and all those very strange, interesting things that we're kind of excited about having happen. In 15 years, what does Solar City look like, and how, you know, how are you going to make it even cooler than it already is? So I think the <coughs> this may even happen sooner than 15 years. We're starting to see this 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 curve. So right now, most of the markets we're in right now, we compete against the the uh, utility. That's our number one competitor. We're starting to see policy shift changes where we're going to have two customers. We're going to have uh, the homeowner to which we sell energy to, and then we're going to have the utility as a customer as well to where we sell grid-related services to. So, so that, that, I think, is going to change. And so then what's going to happen is the utility, I don't think the utility is going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So the utility provides a, a, good, a good feature. The utility is now going to have access to millions of so little power stations across their grid. With the solar generation and the, the storage device, they're going to have the software application, which they will then essentially manage millions of distributed systems the same way we would normally manage their own power plant. And they will load balance the grid, they'll manage the grid, um, but instead of them building out the infrastructure themselves, they can use other people's <coughs> infrastructure. Now, we've seen this model happen. Like uh, Salesforce.com is probably known for uh, software as a service, and they kind of in, in, uh, created a logo around that, no, no software. Um, th this is essentially infrastructure as a service. Somebody else is providing the infrastructure, and um, the utility then will use that infrastructure as, as a service. Now, why this policy has to change, today, the utility cannot use somebody else's infrastructure because they don't make any money. Like, the rule is very clear. You only make money if you pay for the infrastructure. If you don't pay for the infrastructure, it's a pass-through cost. So if we sell it to the utility for $10, they can only rate base $10, so they make no money. <coughs> if you create an open field, it'll allow tremendous innovation into the electrical infrastructure. I don't know what technologies will be created, but create an open platform, say, here's the problem, bid out the solution, utility subscribes, uh, takes that, the winning bid of that solution. If the utility would have done it themselves, this is to say that project would have cost a million dollars, they bid it out, um, and so they would make 10% of that million dollars. Uh, if they bid it out, new technology would come out, maybe it only cost 500,000, they still make 10% of 500, but this way, the utility has a lower cost, the ratepayer has a lower cost, and it uh, allows for innovation in a market that has seen almost no innovation. Like, the, the best innovation that we have right now is smart meters. And they're not that smart. <laughs> but it's not being used. Like, it, it's like you don't have to go and send somebody to actually measure the, the meter. And by the way, a lot of places still have to measure the meter. Um, but it has no control function. It, it just, it's just 
Let's just sit there. So you just remote measurement of your meter. Like that's the, that's the stuff we've done in like the last 15 years in, in our electrical infrastructure. I think we can do better than that. Now, could you, could you start to link Solar City customers and create your own grid? <laughs> and would that make any sense? Um, we are doing that. So we launched a microgrid product uh, beginning of this year, and that's to, uh, starting to take up, do really well. Um, uh, why it's important for microgrid, not necessarily because we, we think that's going to be a big market. It's, it's going to be a decent market. But we want to show that this combination of uh, distributed solar combined with storage uh, is actually makes the grid more stable. You actually have a more reliable grid. You actually have it far better. So we want to prove it out and then go back to the utility and partner with the utility and say, look, use this. Use this software. Use this application. Use our assets. Get other people to log on to, to it um, and, and manage your grid more efficiently. Uh, it'll be and you really think it's worth it to bang your head against that wall, that utility wall, rather than just slowly but surely build your own grid so that we don't really need them? So, so, so the one thing that... Or is it that solar doesn't quite generate enough? No, we can... So one thing that you need is you need load balancing. And the only way you do that is, is you have to have a wire from house to house. Right. And then you need um, the... I mean, you could have batteries too, right? So you I have mean, the batteries, but even if you have Tesla batteries, batteries... So if you have a self-contained <coughs> unit with, with no, no access to the grid, you have to, you have to design the system for your one-day peak load of the year. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, a tip, difficult, or it's, it's, you're oversizing the system for your use. But if you can connect wires from one house to the next house, um, this person's one day peak load doesn't match this person, you can load balance. And that's essentially our distribution infrastructure, that's what the utility has, that's what they provide. Um, the, the lines coming into our neighborhoods are ugly, we definitely do not want two of them. Right. Um, so that's, that's the... So that's the one place where the monopoly still makes sense, is uh, to only have one set of lines coming in. And so you want to bang your head against this. Uh, I mean, I mean, okay, well, what if you did this? What if you, every time you install in a house, the deal is you also drill underneath and you drill a wire that goes into every neighbor's house to, to the wall. And then if that neighbor signs up, you then link, and they're linked and then another neighbor signs up, and they're linked. And then just slowly but surely, it just grows out. Nobody sees it. It's done on the property. And, and so, I love that idea, <laughs> other than the fact that it's illegal. Um, <laughs> wait, wait, no, no. You're, you go to the end of the property. Yeah, no. Oh, it's illegal yeah. to go to your, the end of your property? You, you're not allowed to connect two homes uh, electrical uh, system. You're not allowed to connect them. You're not allowed to? No, allowed Even if you buy Who two... Who created that law? Even if the property is your own property... Um, you can't connect them um, unless you get special approval to, to do that. Um, but yeah, no, no. It's, Is that that's just like the utilities have rigged the deal? Oh, a lot of cases. Uh, that, that's the case. So, so not not impossible to get that changed, right. but that that will be a big, big. Uh, that'll be a big fight. Um, yeah, I mean, we can we can start setting just, it up. I'm, so I'm just thinking that, you, you send the, the fight, wires just, just to that moment, just yeah. to that place. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a and cool then idea. you do it on the other side. Yeah, yeah. You only connect them when the law makes it. Yeah, and, exactly. And make it you, legal. you get everything right. You get you get the economies of scale. So when the when the law turns on, you just boom. boom. Yeah. Exactly. I like that. I, okay. That'd be good. Uh, hopefully they can change before then. Okay, I got one more question. You guys, I should probably have the hook eventually, but I got one more question, and that is, uh, how do investors value Solar City? What's the not today? Not very well. <laughs> not very yeah, I mean, it's today. It seems undervalued, but but how do they look at it? How do the optimistic investors look at it, and how do the pessimistic investors look at it? And because it's, it's such a complex system, yeah, so, so, with so, the loans, and then long term, you get, you become a utility, you know. So, so the so the best way to look at it is what value are we creating every time we deploy a solar system? So when we deploy a solar system, we have to pay back our uh, tax equity investors. We have to pay back our debt providers. So after we've paid back everyone, uh, how, much, uh, how much money is left for us? Because the tax equity investors and our debt providers cover our cost. So we, we have to pay them all back. And when you do the net present value 
of that cash flow that comes to us after we paid everybody back, we make roughly a little over a dollar a watt. Um, uh, this year, uh, uh, the forecast that we, we uh, reported in uh, our last uh, earnings uh, call was 900 uh, to a gig of deployment. So at a, at a buck, that would be roughly making uh, 900 to a billion dollars a year. So that would be at our, the current at, at our current at your current level. level. So if you and that's the, 900 to a billion dollars uh, revenue to you so, or so net? So you? it's net after all cost. So it's net, net, net. Um, no way. Companies should be worth 20 <laughs> billion dollars. A lot today. more. So, so, the, so, so then the, so the debate comes in with investors is, <clears throat> okay, well, it, that value is an NPV net value over a 30 year period. We use a 6% discount rate. You know, some investors may use an 8% mm -hmm. discount rate. Apply whatever discount rate you want. It's worth a lot more than it is today. Um, then, uh, I see. So that's a, that's a dollar a watt now, but it happens way later. It so over 30 so years. you're really getting um, you're getting a dollar a watt over 30 years. So you no, do actually, have to put some dollars, sort of a discount rate. We're getting four, rate on four dollars a watt over 30 years. Uh, oh yes, so so, so, oh. so so the NPV value is roughly a dollar. So so, it, it, so it's NPV days. at like a hurdle rate of three percent or something. We use six. Yeah. yeah and and right. so the uh, you can Still run cheap. Sense, you can run sensitivity, and if you just look at our current installations, so after dead and everybody else, um, it, it's it's roughly around three billion dollars. Uh, that's just the assets generating cash today. Those are the assets we've deployed. Um, uh, an, an example I like to use is we have a geese, it makes golden eggs. If you just look at the golden eggs, that's uh, $3 billion. Currently, there's no value for the geese, for the goose. Um, so what's more valuable? The, the, the thing that makes the golden eggs or the golden eggs? And um, the thing that makes the golden eggs, in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're figuring it out. It, it is midterms. They're trying to figure out like what. So actually, what's more valuable than the The answer makes, is A, B, or none of the above. It's uh, the thing that B. Makes, the thing that makes the golden eggs, uh, the golden geese, is better. So uh, what's our timing? Anybody? What time is it? It's 5.23. Okay, we got seven more minutes. Okay. So, yeah, in a second. Um, okay, so what, how do you think, you know, you've, you've dealt with local governments and federal government and state government, you've dealt with all these governments. What do you think we should do? I mean, well, first, do you think they operate properly? And then second, what, what needs to happen? So um, governments vary by state. Um, quite a bit. Uh, uh, I, I got to give tremendous credit to, to California. I think it's one of the best governments in, in, in the world. Uh, Governor Brown is an incredible leader um, and is, is passionate about our climate cha challenges that we have. So it, it is good policies in California. Um, they've came up with pro uh, long term programs, no stops and starts, um, and, and has allowed the industry to grow. So, so about 40% of the, the U.S. industry is in, in California. Um, New York is now reinventing its whole electrical infrastructure and is starting to deploy that vision I'm describing where, where infrastructure is a service and you can interact with the utilities. So that's going to be another. So, so Governor Cuomo is, is a, another strong leader in, in this, this area. Um, a few of the other states ha have, have done too, but then a lot of states have done anything. Um, so... We have the solution. We know how to solve the problem. We just, get, we just need to start implementing it. And I think the biggest thing that can happen, like the industry is growing at 40 50%. It will continue to do really well. But the biggest risk to uh, the industry right now, I'd say, is the 30% tax credit. So that would be a fatal policy. And it would be a shame to see... Fatal policy to get rid of it completely. It automatically expires, or at least it goes down from 30% down to 10%. Unless there's an active uh, change to keep it at 30%, um, it, it won't. Uh, and, it will... and you said it's 2016, so you would 
that would have to happen in an election year. So, uh, if, and that would be it would be hard for people to get anything done in an election year, right? Yes. So, so the uh, there's a small probability that it might happen at the end of this year um, with the oil export bill that that uh, may get momentum. And if that gets momentum, then as a trade, um, continue the the uh, federal tax credit. Um, if that doesn't happen, then the only other option would be in the lame duck. Um, uh, end of next year, mm -hmm. and then if that doesn't happen, then you'll have a lapse um, on the credit, and then maybe get it through in uh, February-ish. When they renew, how do, how long do they renew for? Is there some period of time? We have no idea. They just um, made so it up. so uh, before it was renewed for eight years. Uh, fossil fuel doesn't have an expiration. Just just in case. You want to know. Okay, we had a question right over here. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, I have two questions. First of all, you talked about the two different customers, the homeowners and the utility. Have you thought about enterprise with government or different company agencies? Second question, uh, you talked about the policies that might need to be changed, such as tax on carbon or incentive, less incentive, the 30% connecting neighbors. What do you think is the most inhibitor, like the one thing that you need to change in terms of government policy to move this forward into the next phase of expansion? So. What's the first question? Well, he wants, he wants the 30 percent. He wants that to stay. Yeah, 30 percent. He I'll said, what, what government policy? The question for the yeah, to just one. Oh, he said, well, what government policy needs to change to improve the, the environment for so, so, something like Solar City so, to so, thrive? Definitely the uh, 30 percent tax credit. Um, that, that's key. Uh, but the other part of your question is uh, businesses as well. Um, so so we, we, we're known for our residential uh, business, but we actually are the largest commercial provider too. Um, we, we've now just taken the leaderboard on it. We, we have uh, about 8% of, of, the, of the market in our, in our commercial uh, rooftop installation. So we do a lot of commercial as well. Okay, cold call question right here. Front row, texting. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, what's your question? <laughs> No, she has one. Come on. Here it is. She Ready? Go. Okay. I, I guess, so I'm a medical student, and um, my, I'm not an engineering student, but um, I guess my concern is that you have, so you have solar energy, about what fraction of that is converted to actual electrical energy? Like 20%, 10%? <coughs> uh, from the sun? What's the efficiency? Yes. So, it, it depends so the question is, what percent of the energy, the solar energy coming into the panel is converted to electrical energy. Yeah, call it, uh, depending on the modules, but between 15 and 22%. And with the new panels? That's the 22%. Okay. So 80% 80 80 is deflected off into heat, right? Sure. So basically, so you, can create, like, you can create deserts, essentially, where you are sending off really high energy heat into the atmosphere, and that can have a lot of environmental considerations that might be hard to model or predict at this point. Um, but I'm interested to know in terms of like your concerns with the lack of efficiency, but then also the underlying <coughs> damages that you can take. Like what, what do you guys No, no, but the, the heat comes anyway. So 100% heat right now. But in terms of like the environment or the habitat beneath the actual plants? Beneath the plants? Yeah. So because you, you create these factories, right? Like there was an example that I read about in um, Arizona where they create these large solar plants. to to collect and process the solar energy. Yeah. Um, but then people have concerns with that, the surrounding environment because obviously you can't just... Oh, this is, yeah, this is solar, solar thermal. Just, so she's been, you've been reading about how the tortoises had to be moved from... So, so, so there's different ones. So you, you have one that reflects <coughs> to a concentrator that then heats up uh, water. Um, so that's, that's a different technology. Um, different so, so, so company. It doesn't uh, cause... Damage, like I, I don't want to like, just emphasize. Uh, well, there's, there's, there's some environment impact, but a lot less than a power plant. Um, like, the alternative is like you go there, bulldoze, build a nasty, nasty power plant, and that has a far bigger impact. If you assume like clear, complete clear skies, you have peak hours from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And if you're, if these are commercially available panels built in homes, um, I mean, like the energy that you produce is per square meter, like what a thousand watts. So, roughly speaking, a per square meter 
Um, uh, you, you do a thousand uh, 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 per square meter. What, one, one kilowatt hour per, per square meter is 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 one hundred percent efficiency. That's just kind of how the the math turns out. So if you do that, so you're looking at uh, two hundred watts, two hundred uh, watt hours. Why don't we take one more question? I'm definitely doing another cold call. You. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got a question? Come on. Best questions come from the cold calls. <laughs> No, no, don't look back. Come on. Yeah, you. You got a question. Um, <laughs> I think that's completely Better questions come from No, us. did you hear that? You hear those questions? I didn't understand it, though. Well, they were the best questions. So I, go I ahead. No, 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 no. Okay, go ahead. Take it. Whatever. I work for a uh, software company, a uh, solar software company as a service called Siten. Um, and we do uh, sales and financial asset management and remote system design. How do you see technology? We talked about when there's going to be uh, the you know, self-driving trucks and factories. How do you see technology playing a role in um, the years, next five, ten years, um, in your sales and asset management level? Uh, <laughs> massive. Like, like the, when we got started, um, a good engineer would take a day to do a design. Um, now, now they do 10 designs a day. Uh, because of software automation, so so, so it, it's uh, it has a massive impact, uh, and companies doing that, I think, uh, not just the design aspect, the, the full asset management, the sales management, yeah, absolutely, it, it, it can have an impact. Okay, we're gonna do do one more. I'm disappointed in you. You in the back, always center back. It's always the weirdest question. Come on. <laughs> so uh, my name is Ali. I'm from the Graduate School of Business, and my question is related to energy storage. So when Tesla's gigawatt factory comes online, is that going to affect your business model at all or not? And second of all, uh, if any of us are particularly interested in energy storage, uh, should we be pursuing that through Tesla or will there be room in solar city eventually for users? It depends on what you want to do in energy storage. Why don't you repeat the question? So, so uh, first question is uh, when the uh, factories at the gigafactory, there's two gigafactories, one solar, one, one battery. But when the battery gigafactory is, is uh, up and running, you know, what type of effect will that have on our business? And then the second one, if you're interested in getting into the space, in the battery space, do you want to get it to go through SolarCity or should you go through, through uh, Tesla? So first one, um, as soon as the, the gigafactory is up and running, it's actually going to help the business tremendously. Um, and, and it will even help it uh, before it gets to full capacity because the cost of storage is coming down dramatically. And as, as that factory ramps, ramps up, the cost comes down. We can start adding this to our solar systems and really creating a, an interesting product. Once again, the product is not necessary backup, although that will be the, primary, uh, the initial product. The biggest product is offering grid-related services to the grid. That's the infrastructure as a service part that I was describing earlier. In terms of what you want to do, it depends on what, what your personality is. If you're looking at, uh, looking at applications for deployment, then SolarCity is uh, a good place to go. If you're looking at uh, engineering, how you can improve the chemistry of batteries, then Tesla is definitely the better place. So it, it's like, it depends on what, what you want to do. All right, we're done. We're done. Thank we you. got Thank the you. hook. Thank you. Thank you.